Another very useful type of virtual environment to render, especially on a one degree of freedom haptic device, is the virtual damper. Like the virtual spring, it's quite simple. There's just a force which is accomplished by multiplying a damping coefficient, B, times the measured velocity of the haptic device. Again, there is a negative sign which tells you that the force will always be opposing the direction of motion. So the goal of a damper is to represent a kind of viscous fluid, such as the molasses shown over here, so that the faster you try to move, the more the device slows you down. And what it should do is provide a very smooth, even motion that prevents the user from moving too quickly. It's also good for taking a spring that might be overly vibratory and making it feel more damped or more stable. So in this equation, the key things to pick are your computation method for the velocity and the value of the damping coefficient. The velocity would be in units of meters per second or maybe some other kind of unit, uh, depending on how, whatever position units you were using. And the force units are in units of newtons. So if force is in newtons and velocity is in meters per second, then the damping coefficient has to be in units of newtons times seconds divided by meters, which may not be a very intuitive uh, unit combination for a variable for you. But what I suggest is that when you first try out a damping coefficient that you uh, would like to render, you should pick something that is an order of magnitude or maybe two orders of magnitude of the stiffness that you rendered when you did a virtual spring. This will generally give you a level of damping that you can feel, but is not so strong that you won't be able to move the device. I'll also point out that the method for computing the velocity is very important. Because the velocity is measured by taking a difference in position and dividing that by a change in time, if there are small variations in position just due to noise from your sensor, those are going to be amplified in the velocity signal. The velocity signal, as mentioned in an earlier lecture, can then be very noisy. We previously described how to come up with a measure of velocity from position data, but in this week's assignment where you'll be having to render a damping based on the velocity signal, we will want to actually filter that velocity signal. Now filtering methods are beyond the scope of this class, so in the assignment you'll actually see some specific code that we're providing for you in order to do a second order filter that will make the velocity signal very smooth. It's possible that with a filter like this you get some delay in the information because it's a second order filter it actually uses uh, delayed information from previous measurements in order to come up with the new measure of velocity. But that means the measure of velocity is always lagging what the true velocity of the device is. And you may notice that this makes your system feel not like a perfect ideal damper. But nonetheless, it will be good enough for rendering realistic feeling uh, haptic virtual environments with damping. And in addition, it can be used to stabilize an overly oscillatory spring or virtual wall. So even more common than the virtual spring, as a building block of virtual environments, people really like to use virtual walls. The idea being that a virtual wall is now an environment that you aren't interacting with all the time necessarily in your virtual environment, but it's a, it's a haptic object that you can encounter. So in this sketch over here, we have a user who is hanging out outside the virtual wall, and the virtual wall is infinitely deep, um, represented here, and then this line right here is the entry into the virtual wall. And we're defining this over here as the positive x direction. And as we saw with the virtual spring, the sign was really important, and so we want to make sure that this um, has the right sign. So what happens as the user starts moving into this virtual wall is eventually you cross over the barrier and then you wind up inside the virtual wall. And so you need to compute what is the penetration depth of the user into the virtual wall. And we're going to use a spring to try to push the user back out with a certain force. And for that, what you can imagine is that if you have this virtual wall here and you have the user who's sitting here, the idea is that there's a spring 
of attached to the surface of the virtual wall that uh, is trying to pull the user back out. So that's actually what's going to be generating this force. And so similarly to rendering a spring, we need to use an F equals KX type equation, except now we need to account for the fact that there's a new equilibrium point. It's not just zero, it's wherever the position of the wall is. And the other thing we need to make sure of is that this is free space over here. So on this side of the wall, we have free space, and the user shouldn't be feeling any forces over there. So sometimes we call that a unilateral spring rather than a bilateral spring, because you only feel the spring on one side of the wall. So the equation that actually gets you there is this one. It says, if x user is greater than x wall, and this part here is a really important step. This is the collision detection. that occurs when we try to find out, are we inside the virtual wall or not? And if the answer is yes, if x user is greater than x wall, and this is a greater than sign because positive x direction is defined this way for the virtual wall and the way we've drawn it, if x user is greater than x wall, then we compute the force as follows. F equals k times x wall minus x user. And the sign convention here is such that the force will be pushing in the negative direction to push the user out of this wall where the wall is on the right-hand side of your screen. And of course, just like in the example with the virtual spring, uh, the stiffness is assumed k is greater than zero.